started the transgender movement in the United States with the idea of codifying it into law. Even in Texas, a lot of Republicans here do not understand the fundamental issue with the Republican Party. And it's, it's actually national because our rich elites don't believe in free speech. There's been a globalist attempt for a long time to disrupt the families and financial standing of the American middle class to reduce its political power. The, the donor class of the Republican Party is far left. Welcome to another episode of Pearl Daily. I am your host, Pearl, and this is the Audacity Network. Okay, so now she's allowed to move before you can even get to a jury trial. Correct. Okay, and what did the Texas Supreme Court tell you? So the Texas Supreme Court, Justice Blacklock, I call him Blackhearted Blacklock, he ruled that they could not stop her from moving to California, even though California had just passed its transgender kidnapping law, saying that she was no more likely to be transition to transition my son in California than in Texas. That's what a political ruling looks like. And is that because he's running for office and it'll piss people off? I'm just, why on earth would he rule that? Why on yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a year you have the right response. So a lot of people, even in Texas, a lot of Republicans here do not understand the fundamental issue with the Republican Party. And it's it's actually national, but it shows itself very clearly in Texas. Fundamentally, what the problem is this. The, the donor class of the Republican Party is far left. So I'll give you an example. The transgender movement in the United States was not started by Democrats. It was started by Republicans. And I'm a lifelong Republican. I learned all this the hard way. Paul Singer, is the largest donor to the Republican Party. And he founded the Human Rights Campaign. You know the yellow equal sign? I don't, but that sounds familiar, but let me see. Okay, the Human Rights Campaign is the largest and most powerful LGBT lobby organization in the world. It's the reason that the State Department put the pride flags on all our embassies worldwide. They are also the people that created the DEI scores for hiring LGBT people, and then they grade corporations on it and that corporations live up to. That was founded by Paul Singer, who is the largest donor to the Republican Party. He also sues everybody. He's very litigious. And Paul Singer also funds the Manhattan Institute. He funds the Claremont Review of Books. He's a big funder of think tanks and and so forth. I mean, you can see interviews that Manhattan Institute fellows have done with him where they talk about his LGBT advocacy. He started the transgender movement in the United States and basically with the idea of codifying it into law. He's the largest donor of the Republican Party and all these people in office receive money from him. And so you have this problem. You've got elected officials that are beholden to a far left donor class. And he's worth six billion. I mean, who's got that? <laughs> like, that's a yeah, lot of he's, money. Who's, he's a hedge fund billionaire. How, how are you going to yeah, compete with that? I don't, I don't have exactly, six billion. How exactly. about you? So imagine you're an elected official in a state office in Texas or in the federal government. You have a liberal donor class that you have to please to get the money to get reelected, but you're getting elected from an electorate like in Texas that's far right. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you solve that problem? Well, one of the easiest ways to solve the problem is you don't ever bring up votes on controversial issues that affect your donors. That's the first thing they tried with me for six years. But I forced them to get to have a vote on the issue. And I made a lot of political enemies in the Republican Party along the way because they didn't want to, they did not want to take a vote on this issue, public vote. So I forced them to take a public vote. I wrote a bill. They substantially passed that bill, but they took three sentences out of it. And so this is the second tactic that they use. They don't vote on bills, but if they have to vote on bills, they put loopholes in the bills so they don't have any effect. And basically they can go to their donor class and say, I left those loopholes for you, give me some money. They can go to the electorate and say, did you see how conservative I was when I passed that bill? So what they did with my bill, there were three sentences they took out, which would have classified chemical and surgical castration of children as felony child sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And in Texas, that'll get you a mandatory life prison in prison. And our, our, our prisons are pretty bad. So it would be an extremely powerful deterrent. They removed those so that parents could fly their children to Colorado or California and just get these procedures done and fly back to Texas. So it had absolutely no effect. And that's that's what the donors wanted as a fallback. And that's the game that gets played all the time in Republican politics. And what's the donor's incentive? Why do they, like, what's their, in, 
is it just because they believe in it or is there some money incentive for them? I think I think it has to do with social beliefs primarily and longer term globalist aspirations, which I, if I had to explain it, I would do it this way. I'm actually writing a book about this. So if you I've lived all over the world. OK, I've lived I've lived in 11 countries. There's only one place in the world that believes in free speech and gun rights and the right to remain silent. All these rights that we take for granted, there's just literally only one place in the world. If you go to the UK, they don't believe in free speech there. Yeah. Talk- Canada, yeah. Canada yeah. affirmatively says free speech is evil. They don't believe in it. Yeah. They don't have gun rights. The UK doesn't have gun rights. Mm-hmm. Germany doesn't have gun rights. Nobody has any of these things. And in America, not everybody believes in these things either. Our rich elites don't believe in free speech. That's why they censored you on YouTube, okay? Because our rich elites don't believe in free speech. They don't believe in gun rights. Likewise, our lower classes in the United States, because they're beholden to government welfare, do whatever the bureaucrats want. And they're also in favor of all of these sort of liberal approaches of limiting speech, no gun rights, et cetera. It's really just the American middle class that believes in all these fundamental rights. And because the American middle class is responsible for electing you know, officers of the federal government, they have an outsized influence on world affairs. And I think there's been a globalist attempt for a long time to disrupt the families and financial standing of the American middle class to reduce its political power mm-hmm. in order to obtain the ability to censor globally and to take away people's gun rights globally and so forth. Okay, so... Their belief essentially, like, so this is just stuff they believe in, and that's their incentive. They're not yes. necessarily making money off of it. Well, the, the hospitals make tons of money. So every child that's transitioned is about a four and a half million dollar lifetime income stream. Wow. And that's a result of federal money. It's not, it's not an innate result. Like, yeah, the puberty blocker drugs are among the most expensive drugs sold in the world. Okay. So they're and they have to stay on these hormones for the rest of their life. And they don't really get new genitals. They get a wound. It's a wound that looks like genitals, but it requires the same wound care that you would if you were shot or if you were cut. And that wound care is a lifetime. So they make tons of money from these kids. Yeah, I've interviewed some after, like they've had it and they like detransit. I've and I've interviewed some detransitions and some of the stuff yeah. they said I could barely listen to. It's pretty graphic. Yes. Like I'm even like clenching up thinking, uh. So from your point of view, is there anything that can really be done to fight this? Like what what can the average person do to help your case or the cases maybe close to them? The, the, the most important thing is, is to push at the state level to outlaw these procedures. If these procedures are outlawed, it just can't happen in your state. Now, it's important that you not let them water these laws down like they did in Texas, and you make sure that it's classified as a criminal offense. So you can't leave the state to go do it. And the other thing is Trump. Trump's on the right track on this. Trump says he's going to decertify any hospital that does these procedures. They will Their federal cert, uh, hospital certification will be removed. And this needs to be done at the state level as well, not only at the federal level, but at the state level. States, hospitals that do this should not be certified as hospitals. You shouldn't be able to have a a medical practice to do this. The other thing as a wider issue is just family court reform, because a court should, should have never had the power to do this to my children and to me in the first place. And so overall family court reform, and I think I can state that very simply, Earl, Mm -hmm. is in this way, unless under the criminal rules, which is beyond a reasonable doubt, unless under a criminal trial, a, a a jury has found that you have abused your children or you abandoned your children, right? There's neglect and abuse. Those are the two part, sides of the spectrum. Everything in between is legitimate parenting. And the state should have no discretion to interfere with your parenting if there's been no f- criminal finding of abuse or neglect. And we need to take discretion away from these judges. There's we, They've just shown they can't they can't use discretion wisely. But of course, as you know, we're up against Title IV D and the massive funding to the states. And that's what family courts really are. They're just uh, funding vehicles. Texas gets half a billion dollars a year from Title IV D. So, you know, what I've proposed in Texas is that you're not going to get the state to give up half a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, good luck. (laughs) So, right. 
So what I proposed is that agencies that co- that collect these funds can't use them. They have to go to other purposes and can't benefit those agencies, which reduces their incentive to collect them. Wait, say that. Can you give me an example of how that would work? Yeah. So the Texas attorney, the reason that family courts were created, they're actually an accounting mechanism so that that state can prove that you paid the child support to get the matching dollars. Like the child support that I used to pay, the state would make about $21,000 a year for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So because I'm paying the state to child support, they can account for every dollar and make sure they get paid. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the Texas attorney general's office in Texas is the one that collects this money. They, they do all the grant applications and everything. So they get the money. Well, the, the point is that the Texas Attorney General's office should not be able to spend that money. It should have to go somewhere else. It should go to border enforcement or some, some, some other part of state funding to reduce the incentive for them to constantly you know, give, create more. Like People don't get that. The reason the family courts always give the children to the dysfunctional parent. It's a very simple calculation on their part. You know, I watched a mother who, after a year, was able to successfully pass a 30-day heroin drug test. She's a heroin addict. The father had custody and had been given custody a year before. I'm sitting there waiting to go into my my hearing, and I'm listening to this one. And she passed this drug test, finally, after three failed ones. And the judge immediately gave the children back to the mom, the heroin addict. It's got to be because the f- dysfunctional parent's never going to be able to pay. Ever. That's right. Yeah, They'll never too, pay child support. That, that, that woman's never going to hold a job if she's Correct. Like, barely passing drug tests. Correct. And then... So they, the, the, st- the, the judges are incentivized to give the children to the dysfunctional parent. But are the judges getting money out of this? They are in some, in some way, states, they, they yeah. are. Yeah. It's like goes, some states, is it their retirement? It's something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In some states, judicial retirement funds are tied to how much Title IV D uh, funds that they that they bring in for the state. In Texas, the Texas Attorney General's office gives judges quotas before they ever hear cases. They're given a, a dollar quota for the year that they have to give in divorces. So that's why sometimes child support is way excessive. It's way high. It's because the judge has a quota that they have to fill. Okay, guys, please like the video on your way out and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. And I will see you tomorrow, three o'clock for another episode of Pearl Daily here on the Audacity Network. I'll see you.